Chinatown. Look at that. Today. Oh, yeah. Same time. Great, so I'll start now. Um, thank you so much everyone for coming. Um, this is a really, really exciting event and well, I'm very excited to share it with all of you. So as many of us know, like colonialism, partition, these are things that have happened across the world, internationally, across history, in different ways, different forms, etc. And you know, it's happened recently, 20th century, etc. as well, as well as you know, way back when. And today, the kind of purpose of this panel is bringing together people who've researched on the experiences of people who've like, lived through the like, repercussions of partition and post-colonialism, the impacts, who've kind of had to deal with it in their day-to-day. -day. It's bringing together people who've both researched history, who've kind of represented politically and socially the perspectives of these people, and people who've kind of represented and documented this work in different ways. So the kind of purpose of this panel is to bring together commonalities and experience, to bring together like a focus on the victims and the aftermath and kind of have a productive conversation that, in my opinion, is one that's often left out of the academic curriculum and one that isn't given nearly enough attention as it should be. So I'm going to start with a brief introduction from all of the speakers, and then I have some questions, then I'm going to open it up to the floor for questions. I'd like to take it away. Sure. Um, well, I'll just be very brief. Um, as, you, as you perhaps know, my name is Richard Burke. Um, I'm a professor in the university here in the history faculty. Um, I grew up in southern Ireland, um, spanning really the duration of the, what's known as the Troubles. So I was born in 1965 um, and um, sort of lived through the 70s. But of course, for much of that, I was a child. But I suppose from the period of what's known as the hunger strikes in 1980, 81, you know, there was sort of dominant uh, political experience for uh, Southerners, obviously Northerners too, and more pressingly. Um, I, I was a graduate student here though, and took an interest in Northern Ireland politics. I should say there was no interest in the university in Northern Ireland politics whatsoever, largely because it wasn't easy to take a side, because there weren't good guys and bad guys, and so, you know, it didn't attract sort of um, student activism, um, which is fine, I'm just saying that, that that's a fact. Subsequently, as, as an academic, largely I've worked in the history of political thought, but I've also written on the Northern Ireland Troubles and um, published, published a book on it just after the, the peace agreement, and th that was based on archival research, but also interviews with um, obviously politicians, um, terrorists, uh, and so on and so forth. Subsequently, I've obviously taken an interest because it's, you know, part of my um, formation, for want of, be want of a better term. So periodically, I contribute uh, journalism to the, to the ongoing situation, but um, that's me in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you. That is really free. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Aditi Kumar, and I'm a postdoc fellow at University of Warwick and also working on a Lever Hume project, which is on migration and post-colonial imagination. So by training, I'm an art historian. Uh, I studied in Jawaharlal Nehru University. So it's also revisiting uh, the place from where my professors have studied, Cambridge. And um, my take on um, you know, partition, because I specialize in South Asian diaspora, and it's been more than a decade that I've been working with the visual culture of diaspora communities specifically women's stories, which are often hidden or not told. So as we go ahead in our conversation, uh, I'll talk more about it. And uh, I exhibit, I'm also a curator and a cultural practitioner. And right now, I'm specifically working uh, with communities from um, Jammu and Kashmir, and uh, both India and Pakistan, uh, you know, the conflict zone, and specifically uh, the Midlands area. And uh, I work with uh, photographs and material memory. So that's me in a nutshell. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, Anushka, thank you so much for the invitation. And thank you to all the union members for organizing this. 
Um, so I'm Dr. Hamara Iqbal. Um, I actually did my PhD from Cambridge, so it's lovely to be back here. Um, and I, um, I'm a social and cultural psychologist. I work at University uh, College London as an associate professor there. And um, for the past um, three years, I would say, I've been studying, um, a pro I've been studying the Pakistani Bengali community. Um, and my work has revolved around the issue of statelessness. Um, so this study has been part of, as I said, a three-year project which I lead called Partition of Identity. And um, the kind of the story of this community um, centers around um, statelessness. And I mean, what is statelessness? I should probably explain it to you. Globally, 15 million of the world's population are stateless. Uh, when you're stateless, it means you're not recognized by a nation state under kind of law. So you're kind of not recognized, you're not um, kind of recognized by, as a member of a, a country or nation. Um, the group that I work with, the Pakistani Bengali community, number in around 3 million. Um, and so that's a sizable proportion of the world's um, stateless population. Um, so, you know, the topic of the panel today is about uh, post-colonialism or colonialism and its aftermath. And you cannot um, understand the story of this group uh, without understanding kind of the historical past um, and issues uh, and, and kind of how um, the subcontinent was partitioned. First in 1947, when there was kind of mass migration um, that happened, there was a huge refugee movement. But then again in 1971, following the liberation war. Um, and so just to say, after 1947, uh, the British left and India uh, was divided into, well, there was India and then there was um, West Pakistan and East Pakistan. So now if you think about it, you're talking about um, one country divided by 1,000 miles, like it's, it's a big distance. Um, and, you know, there was, um, right during the time of the British, um, I'm just going to take a little bit of time to give context for where I pass on because it's quite a complicated issue. During the time of the British, so one of the strategies and tactics used by colonizers is racialization and othering. Um, and really, indeed, with the, the, the Bengali community, there's been this kind of notion of racializing and otherizing right from the start. For example, um, the British had this idea of the martial races. Um, those were the brave uh, kind of individuals, groups who were allowed to be part of the army. The Bengalis were never part of this um, group. Um, they were not kind of categorized. Just, that's just one example of kind of um, categorization of pop populations and otherizing, making them different. And this subsequently, after uh, Pakistan emerged and you had West Pakistan and East Pakistan, it kind of continued, this otherizing, racializing. And um, West Pakistan, which had all of the power, in a sense, which is now Pakistan, did not, I, I would say, like, it's very arguably, did not give equal representation to East Pakistan. And there was a lot of unrest. In 1971, what happened was um, elections happened, and uh, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, who won the, the, uh, the West, East Pakistan candidate, was not handed over power. There was a war that happened, ensued civil unrest, a, a war with, a kind of incredibly violent war happened. India became involved and then there was separation. So you have Bangladesh and Pakistan. This is the time point where I step in and my work kind of comes about because there was um, a migration of, um, um, remember it was one country. So they were Pakistanis from the East who came to the West, Pakistani Bengalis. But the issue is that their citizenship, their status has not been recognized as Pakistani citizens. And we're talking four generations now. Um, and this is a case of intergenerational citizenship, uh, statelessness, so you're, you can be born stateless, imagine that. Um, and it's very, very complicated because it, it's tied to issues around digitization um, of citizenship cards, which I'll talk to about later documentation. But ultimately, it boils down to discrimination and non-implementation of the law. So I've spent um, the last three years doing oral history interviews, um, working with the community. We made a documentary film. Um, we, we done, we've had a comic book that's come out. Um, lots of different forms of kind of um, research work we've been doing to understand and archival evidence the story of this group. So after that kind of description, I'm going to pass on to Cyprus. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you to, to the Union for the Invitation. Uh, my name is Christos. I'm president of the National Federation of Cypriots. I'm not an academic. I, I, I studied at Oxford, in fact. I'm a former secretary of the other place at Oxford, so it's nice <laughs> to be here tonight. Um, 
My role is very much as a kind of community activist and political engager. So the, the National Federation represents the 300,000 strong Cypriot diaspora here in the UK. I'm also the secretariat for the all-party parliamentary group for Cyprus. And actually a lot of our work revolves around engaging on the Cyprus issue. And, in, and that is both Greek and Turkish Cypriot. So I might also take a, a second just to give a bit of context given the Cyprus issue is one of the lesser well-known um, conflicts. And actually, to understand it, like some other conflicts, it does stem back to um, colonial past. So, you know, Britain was, was given Cyprus in 1873 as a colony from Turkey. And uh, during that period, there was a similar type of otherizing, you know, similar examples of uh, the British um, uh, Cypriot uh, Parliament or Legislative Assembly constituted of kind of six Greek Cypriots, uh, sorry, six, nine Greek Cypriots, three Turkish Cypriots and six ex officio British. So it was pitting the communities against each other. That culminated in an independence struggle which resulted in Cyprus being given independence in 1960. But that legacy of pitting the communities against each other resulted in a subsequent Turkish invasion in 1974 and the ongoing division and occupation that we see today. So I think from my perspective, my contributions tonight are going to focus very much on, on some, of the, some of what we've seen in Cyprus in terms of the legacy of post-colonialism. I would also say, to be fair and balanced, Cyprus was set up by the UK so that it could be a modern functioning democracy, right? Legislative assemblies, um, land registries, everything in terms of proper and good governance, which to some extent allowed Cyprus to survive that invasion. But, you know, I think some of the themes that a couple of us will bring out this evening will probably be somewhat similar. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, you, the, we've saved, uh, we've an Irish man at this end, an Irish man at this end, uh, <laughs> one from the, the south, one from the north. I'm Ian, Ian Jeffers. Uh, I feel like a complete fraud because I'm not an academic either. Uh, you even went to Oxford, I can't even say I went to Queen's <laughs> University, I think I went to Belfast Tech actually. But my current role is Chief Executive of Corporation Ireland, so we're a north-south, so North Ireland and south of Ireland, peace building, peace and reconciliation charity. Uh, this is week four for me in that particular role. The role that's probably more relevant for tonight is my previous role as Commissioner for Victims and Survivors, specifically of the Troubles. Uh, and to, to put that into its context, uh, Richard talked about the Good Friday Agreement or the Belfast Agreement. It's 25 years old last year, but we still haven't resolved many of the issues around what we we'll call the legacy of the past or the legacy of the Troubles. Uh, the Commission for Victims and Survivors came out of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. That was one of the things that was in it, to say we should have a commission, but at the same time the Belfast Good Friday Agreement said victims are going to be hard to deal with, let's kick it down the road a bit and we continue to kick it down the road. Uh, you will have seen, any of you follow sort of what has happened uh, in UK politics, the Legacy Act has gone through over the last uh, numbers of months. Uh, it started two years ago as the, the Northern Ireland Troubles Legacy and Reconciliation Bill, opposed by all political parties in Northern Ireland for different reasons, opposed by the Irish government, opposed by the Americans. Uh, and it has been pushed through by a Conservative government, uh, allegedly to drive reconciliation, but actually it's not. It, it's the complete reverse of what it will do, and happy to, to chat about that tonight. But just to put it into context, in Northern Ireland, a survey that the Commission for Victims and Survivors did three years ago, 24% of people could identify as a victim. So the entire population, small population, about 1.8 million roughly, 24% could identify as a victim of the Troubles. Could identify them, not necessarily do identify, they could. The same survey we did last year in the Republic in the south of Ireland, and the figure was 10%. And it's largely within the southern government, and Richard, you will know more about this than I, but there, there's always been a bit of denial. And indeed, when I presented those figures originally to the Irish government last year, they immediately questioned the data rather than actually say, we might have a challenge here, we might have a problem, because we want to ignore our victims and survivors, and that's really what my purpose is in, in, in debates like this, is to make sure that the voice of victims and survivors is heard, and we recognise the pain and the suffering that they continue to go through. So I look forward to tonight's conversation. Great. Thank you, everyone, for those extremely interesting um, introductions. 
I'm going to begin with a question that I think has been touched on a bit already, but is intended to kind of think about the issue in a slightly more general way. What do you think, and we don't, you don't all have to answer every question, if you feel like you've already answered it, there's no need to again, but what do you think are the legacies and impacts of partition generally on a community and the kind of aftermath that comes from things like these? Shall I start or...? I'd yeah, up to anyone. Um, well, first of all, um, you're asking about partition and colonialism or just partition? If both apply oh, or if either applies... The title. I just want to... I feel I must align with the title. Um, <laughs> well, I should say that these are... Uh, partition and colonialism are very different things. Um, colonialism itself doesn't mean one thing. Um, colonialism originally meant um, the settlement of a population in a new territory um, still falling under the authority of the mother country. So it was, um, s you know, settlers who went forth to cultivate colere in the Latin, meaning, you know, they were colonial settlers and farmers. That's one model that came out of the British Empire. Uh, America was, in that sense, colonized. South Africa was, in that sense, colonized. Um, India was not colonized by the British in that sense. But in the late 19th and 20th century, the word colonialism came to have a wider significance of anything happening under an empire. So from that point of view, anything that fell under any of the European empires was a colonial experience. But do bear in mind that it's a slightly odd linguistic development, because these are very different um, experiences. Actually, India was previously co colonized before the British ever arrived by three ways of three waves of, um, at least three waves over many centuries, of Muslim settlers. So uh, colonization in that sense is not modern, it's not exclusively European, and it has these divergent meanings. I think it's worth clarifying the facts. Partition, then, is also very variable. I mean, the Roman Empire was partitioned, the Ottomans were partitioned. It's not normally what we mean by partition, but of course Germany was partitioned, uh, Korea was partitioned, but most people, when they think about partition, they think about Cyprus, Ireland, Palestine, India. But I'm just saying they're not the only partitionings that have taken place. Partition, it should be said, in the cases that I know about, I mean, we think of these things as just simply malevolent, but actually they're, they're happening in a complex field of politics. And they're designed as a solution. Now, of course, these solutions have, in most cases, backfired. But not, not just intended... I mean, the reason that Ireland is partitioned is not because the nasty British came and partitioned, it's because there was a divided population. It's not a manufactured division either. This is the sort of um, narrative that emerged that was British divide and rule. Trust me, they were divided anyway. And partition was conceived, admittedly, it was forced through by one community um, in particular, but nonetheless, it was conceived as a solution to a problem, albeit we're living with the legacies of that failed solution. So I suppose the point I'm trying to make is these are complex categories uh, they're not Manichaean, it's not good and bad. Um, partition is often called for on the ground. It's led to difficulties, but I think we should not be instantaneously moralistic about this, but look at it contextual, contextually in the round. Yeah, of course, please. So I would uh, be audacious enough to uh, not fully challenge, but uh, not fully agree with what you said about That's partition what completely. <laughs> So because I've been working on partition for the last 10 years, I do be, uh, partially you're correct that it was a solution, but the aftermath was humongous. 17 million people were displaced and dislocated from the subcontinent. 10 million died in that. Could I just uh, clarify? I said solutions which backfired. Yes, I'm yes. I'm adding to it. Sure, I'm extending on it. And it cannot be just said generalized, you know. 17 million is a huge population which was divided on the basis of religion. And pre-partitioned subcontinent, it could not be divided on the basis of religion because it's so multicultural, so diverse. So dividing two countries, now India and Pakistan, on the basis of Hindu, Muslims or Sikhs was a blasphemous act. And of course, I... Um, would blame somewhere the British policies for that, not fully take away that it was a mere solution. Having said that, I would rather not comment more on colonialism, but the effects of partition on present-day British Asian community. 
that specifically includes Indians, Pakistanis, and Bangladeshis. So because I have been working with their material, with their oral histories, which have been hidden for decades, and they are nerve-wracking. They just, you know, if you're documenting such stories which haven't been told before, uh, both in the subcontinent, uh, because I studied in India, New Delhi, and I have a kind of, I'll just talk about the community aspect, what effects it had on generations in sense of trauma and, you know, really rebuilding after, uh, a, you know, a decade or seven decade long amnesia, because there's collective amnesia around partition and the trauma of partition, as we read about the Holocaust. You know, and Holocaust everywhere in Europe, you have museums, you have oral uh, records, and you know, if you go to Imperial War Museum, uh, both in London and Manchester, you have records from uh, the survivors who survived the Holocaust. So something like that, which is now being spoken, maybe three decades, and specifically the women's stories. I've worked with such stories which they never even, uh, you know, shared with the loved ones. Because there was always this hush-hush. If you read, of course, there is a sociological framework which justifies that silence, like the work of Marianne Hirsch, or Veena Das, or Ritu Menon from uh, Sadia Ahmed from the subcontinent, who talk about these women's stories. Because they were the uh, uh, Urvashi Batalia, Veena Das, and they were amongst the earliest feminist writers who wrote and documented those stories. Because there is an element of shame connected with the stories of uh, rape, abduction, you know. And there are, uh, you know, uh, there are movies and documentaries that have been made where women jumped into the wells to save the family honor. So the family honor came ahead of the lives of the women. And those stories, people don't know. Even this exhibition that I did at SOAS, uh, and you know, uh, you know, University of London for three months, and we had this uh, invitation uh, for first-generation families whose uh, uh, family albums, photographs, and material objects we put on display. So I met this first-generation person, and then his son, who is British Asian, he of course studied here, was born and brought up here. He didn't know the Re Repatriation Act. So I have just a quick question: How many in the room know the Repatriation Act? between the Indian government and the P Pakistani government? Yeah, you do? Can I just quickly ask you very informally, what do you understand by it? Just a line or so. Sorry? I can't. Yes. Yes, that's correct. Thank you so much. So there was this duality, there was this double violence that was done to the women. So there was no agency of women, you know, it was all state orchestrated. So just going a little deeper into it. So in 1950s and late 1950s and 19, early 1960s, the government of India and Pakistan made this act together that we will exchange our women. And mind you, these women had already remarried either to their abductors or people who would have taken them in and converted to the opposite religion. And from now, their second marriages, or whomsoever they got married, they had children. So that's the double act of violence which was perpetrated on them, you know? So stories like these were never ever spoken about in families or, you know, the families they moved to. For instance, I interviewed a first-generation partition survivor back in Jammu and Kashmir. And he said that when I went to Pakistan, so there was this special bus service which was started between Jammu and Pakistan. Um, a peace convoy. So where the people who didn't have any blood relations living on the other side were invited to visit their ancestral land. So this one person, C.P. Gupta from Jammu, he went to... Uh, Azad Kashmir or Pakistan administered Jammu and Kashmir, uh, which is the ongoing conflict is still there. So he was approached by a middle-aged lady, a 
approximately like 50 years old and she came with her son and she was a Muslim lady. And she said that my mother is still there on the other side of the border. And she was taken during the Repatriation Act and extracted from the family and re, you know, given back to the uh, Hindu family where she was made to remarry in a Hindu uh, family. Sorry, am I sounding a little confusing? <laughs> Or is it, it makes sense. So then she was like, please, can you make me speak to my mother just once? I just want to hear her. And he was like, okay, I'll try my best. So when he went back to Jammu, that's the Indian part. So he approached the family where the brothers lived and, you know, the family belonged. So they were like, we'll kill you here only. And nobody will know. Never, ever take that to my sister. So family honor, you know. And... And the old lady died and she could never ever speak to her uh, daughter who was left behind. So there are many stories like these. So who, who is going to take the responsibility of uncovering them or documenting them? So third generation here, or from you know, British Asians, don't know such stories. Or Britishers generally in curriculum. So it's only now that the government is taking steps to introduce that in schools, in GCSE, history classes, like Black Lives Matter, it's, it's look, you know, how George Floyd's case came to light. It's a social media, right? So BLM doesn't just become one month, or South Asian Heritage Month doesn't become just one month, but history has to change. These micro-narratives have to become part of our study curriculum, both at the school level, as well as, you know, the university level. So that's it. So what I was coming at, at SOAS, that person who is himself a son of a first generation partition survivor didn't know about this exchange of, you know, women from... So that's a person who belongs to a family of survivors. So imagine the rest of the country, whether the subcontinent, whether Britain. So these stories need spaces to be heard, to be listened and introduced formally, officially in curriculums. I think when you, you consider the question being the legacy, what, what we're left with, and if you look at, you know, from an Irish perspective, you know, the legacy of what happened, you can go back to 1921, 22 and so forth, and, you know, at that time there was about 500 people who were, lost their lives, particularly in the north, there was about 10,000 refugees, predominantly from the Catholic community, forced out of what became Northern Ireland into the Republic of Ireland. You consider the legacy now, you fast forward to 1969 and the start of the Troubles and 30 years of the Troubles of the Conflict, which took 3,720 lives, 50,000 injured, hundreds of thousands potentially with trauma-related injuries and so forth. So ultimately the legacy is we never deal with it. Uh, and that's the, the big issue we have. If we fast forward to today, we're looking at some ways of still correcting the errors of, our, of the past because we haven't dealt successfully with it. Uh, and driving things like a legacy bill through to try and address the past doesn't work either or won't work either. Uh, we don't seem to have learned from our mistakes of the past in some ways. So I think it's really important to have that debate, of, to recognise that things that happened you know, a hundred years ago, whether it was in Ireland's case or hundreds of years ago in others, you know, we're still, we have legacy of that today that needs addressed and it needs debated. The stories do need told uh, in a different way and it, we have to bring it to life because if we don't talk about it, it doesn't go away. And that's one of the, I firmly believe that we have a government that loves to think that over time these things will die, but they don't because yeah. children take it on, grandchildren take it on and it continues. Um, in Pakistan, um, you know, there's a selective amnesia, is what you would say, about the events of 1971. Um, it's, it's such a, it's a period which um, is just, I mean, I uh, lived in Pakistan and actually, uh, when I studied um, in, in secondary school, uh, the history of Pakistan, I learned about 1971, and it was only when I went to university, I'm like, oh, oh, okay, this is really not what I learned in, in the school textbooks, because textbooks have been rewritten to ter tell a particular narrative. And in you know, the case of the community that I'm working with, I mean, the, the textbooks have been rewritten to say that it was a war with India, and that's what, you know, that's what happened. But, you know, the, the fact is that there was not equal treatment of this community for a long time. And really, there is this feeling that, how dare they leave? 
us? You know, how dare they leave? How dare they choose to have, have be independent? You were part of the same country. And so for the community who did decide to come back to, to, to Pakistan, you know, they are seen as outs the eternal outsider, as kind of uh, outsiders, as kind of traitors, as spies, as never kind of, why should they belong? And even if they do have their papers, they're often blocked in citizenship registration offices because of the immense discrimination. And when I was there, I was actually doing field work um, when it was the 50 year anniversary. And um, so, you know, it was a 50 year anniversary of the formation of, of Bangladesh. And in Pakistan, lots of films had been made to commemorate what happened. But actually, I went to a lot of these films uh, to just see what they were like in the cinema. And it was, it was a war with India, you know, it was not. It, and it was like, how dare they leave us? So it's this kind of dominant narrative that is perpetuated. And that becomes very dangerous because you completely don't tell. So I think, you know, like work you do is very important to get this, this narrative out. And, and I think, look, just, you, you're completely right about the narrative, but I think, um, and, and certainly you see that, let's say if I'm going to talk about Cyprus, back on the island of Cyprus, actually what you see over here in the UK is Greek and Turkish Cypriots do get on incredibly well, right? Especially for those of you that may know North London, um, you will see that the two communities live side by side, thrive, work together in business. So this idea that there's, there's, there's a division between the two communities might exist back on the island, but actually over here, you definitely don't see that. Um, now, in terms of the, the, the broader legacies, I, could, I could kind of completely agree around the idea of... You know, population divisions in Cyprus actually it was just touching on your point it was the British that introduced the concept of Greek and Turkish Cypriots prior to that it was Muslim Cypriots Orthodox Cypriots which inherently gave a right to mother countries of Greece and Turkey to then start meddling in the internal affairs so the extent to which there was culpability or not I'll, I'll, I'll leave you to judge but that subtle shift is actually quite important for the for the legacy of Cyprus um you, you know, yes, after the uh, invasion, there was massive displacement, right? 200,000 um, Greek Cypriots were forcibly evicted from their homes. That, that was a third of the population at the time, right? In the UK context, that would be 20 million people being kicked out of their homes. That would be a landmass the size of Scotland under occupied. Like, it's a huge proportion. So, yes, Simon's, Cyprus is a small island in the East Med, but actually... The, the, the scale of, of what, what happened and what continues to happen, right, the legacy is there. There's a, you know, only three weeks ago, a new UN envoy was appointed to see if you can restart reunification talks because actually you do need to, to deal with that legacy. And to your point in terms of the stories, one of the ideas that's now being openly discussed on the island is this idea of a truth and reconciliation commission mm -hmm. so that all those stories can come out and people can tell their narrative because as, as part of rebuilding that trust between the two communities goes, that, that's a really important part. Can I just add one tiny Of course, yes. A very, just a very, very concrete example of um, a, a legacy that's been left by the British in Pakistan is uh, the genealogical, the legacy of record keeping and the ge geological nature of citizenship. So, you know, you have citizenship according to, like, family ties and uh, kind of genealogical networks, uh, which is three to four, you know, levels deep. And, you know, um, what happened in the case of the community I work with was when this became digitised, entire family clusters were digitised on a system. And if one member of the family might have done something wrong or had their card blocked, the entire family was blacklisted. So that there is, it was a very specific, it's called the Sharjah Inasab, it was a record keeping documentation around um, kind of um, to understanding family lineages, but also understand it's for, it was for revenue purposes. But it was, it's a very specific example of a legacy that has caused so much you know, damage to entire, uh, you know, kind of families uh, because, because of that. I mean, there's so many other, I'm sure, so many concrete <coughs> examples we could give. But I just wanted to give um, something because, you know, it takes a long time for, for you know, laws continued and, and practices continued and they didn't often change. And, you know, in the modern day, it can, it can cause um, issues. So, Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. So I guess my next question, kind of building off that, is how can a community rebuild after partition or colonialism or slash and in some cases? Because we've spoken a lot about what the impacts and what the legacies are like at the moment. And 
in some ways it might be possible, like impossible to ever fully rebuild, but what are some kind of measures that we see taken, or what are some measures that should be taken to kind of help communities heal and move forward from what happened? Maybe I'll go first, uh, as I'm supposed to lead a peace and reconciliation uh, charity. Uh, and unfortunately, I can probably talk about things that don't work uh, more than anything else, but I have a good idea of what can work, and there's been some examples, predominantly at community level. And I think that's one of the key things. Initiatives like this need to work at community level. Uh, generally, solutions or ways forward or ways to acknowledge the past imposed by a government haven't worked in some respects. Uh, and again, we can look at the, the, le the, the, the legacy bill, as it's called, in the UK as imposing an information recovery. The, the Independent Commission for Reconciliation and Information Recovery uh, has, and it will start the 1st of May this year, supposedly to get to the truth of what happened during that period in the Troubles. But ultimately, if you listen to victims and survivors, the, the thing that we can do the most about is give them knowledge. And of that I do agree, some sort of information recovery is key, and we've talked briefly about that. With knowledge also, they need acknowledgement. You have to acknowledge the suffering of individuals, and you can do that without judgment necessarily. So I think it's really key, that knowledge and acknowledgement side of things. And you could debate, does it need an apology then? Uh, that's a different sort of area, because who's going to apologize? We've seen government apologies, for example, for Bloody Sunday and so forth, but we don't see a wholesale apology. Uh, and as Richard pointed out, there wasn't a good and a bad in there. There weren't winners or losers in the, in the troubles and so forth. It was a dirty war, if you like, and some would even criticize me for calling it a war, but it was a dirty conflict, certainly, from that point of view. But going forward, you know, the, the key things are that knowledge and acknowledgement. Oral history, I think, is a key thing within it. And the, the thorny issue around memorialization. We see it with the Holocaust, where it really works. People have places to reflect uh, from a, a recent conflict, as we have in Northern Ireland. You know, what on earth do you do for memorialization? Do you have a wall with everybody's name on it? Because you can guarantee somebody will say, well, I'm not going beside that name. So there's still a lot to address in there. There's great, great question. I mean, I, I there is a you know I I can sound very pessimistic, but believe me, my glass is half full rather than half empty. If we look at the community level, that's where the successes are. Uh, you can go around areas in Belfast that are still divided. We still have more peace walls than most places, etc., which in itself is a weird description. We call a wall that segregates two communities a peace wall. But if you look on either side of that, you will see groups and individuals, very strong women's sector as well, who lead an awful lot of this and are very courageous uh, on some of these things. And that's where it's going to happen. Uh, government, I think, has a responsibility to help that, uh, but it needs a stable government, uh, which, yeah, we'll not go down there tonight, and that's another <laughs> debate all together. Yes, of course. Yeah. So just adding on uh, to that, so uh, because I primarily work with British Asians, so I can speak for them, uh, you know, to a certain extent. So a uh, few years ago, uh, under the mayor of London, he set up this uh, commission of uh, members from the community, and that includes artists, cultural practitioners, scholars, architects. So I'm also part of that committee. And uh, it's called uh, Diversity in Public Realm. And there's going to be multiple sites where they are going to commemorate people from the Commonwealth, especially the uh, contributions of British Asians to British history, and which actually takes into cognizance people who contributed uh, during World War I, World War II, like um, Sophia Dilip Singh, who was a suffragette, and then Inayat Khan. So, you know, people who had, and also what I understand from decolonization, what I've been also teaching uh, at university, is it's, it's not like breaking the canon or being against the canon, rather reflecting to have voices of non-white contributions. And that's basically Commonwealth, 
South Asia, Africa, you know, to have, to take space actually in the history and, and now acknowledging that, you know, such people had contributed to the history. And there's going to be upcoming monument which actually commemorates uh, people from the Commonwealth. And I'm very fortunate to be part of that 20 member team where we could actually contribute to the history making, which is now, you know, being introduced in school curriculars or university level teaching because it just, just doesn't become an elective, like I taught race and identities, which was an elective, but a mainstream, you know, uh, the main uh, coursework, it's part of that, you know, where students just you don't choose it as an optional subject or coursework. So that's uh, important. And second part is community and, of course, dialogue. We say reconciliation are, you know, words, but really take it at ground level. For instance, we, um, I did this event at Warwick University. It was a co-creative project where unlike, you know, the pedestrals of a conference hall, we call the community members from first generation partition survivors uh, to second generation British Asians and third generations. So it was also a very sensitive topic, but at the same time it was challenging to get all ethnic communities in one room. You know what I mean? And they all were made to sit in a round table rather than you know, faculty members up on a pedestal and common people on the ground. So they were the participants, uh, speakers. So it was interesting to see, so there were uh, British Asian Punjabis, British Asians who came from Africa, Windrush, and there were Indians who came directly from the Indian subcontinent, and Pakistanis who came directly from Pakistan. So it was interesting to see the conversations that unfold, because Within the partition of the subcontinent, there are multiple narratives, which these communities didn't know. Because unlike the subcontinent here, what I've realized, specifically in the Midlands and up north, communities live in certain areas, you know. So, for instance, in Leicester, uh, I have also lived there. So the Muslim community will be in one area. The Gujarati community will be in one area. So often they would not brush across each other on the road. But there they were sitting in one room and having these conversations. So I invited um, a woman, a Muslim woman, who uh, was born in Gujarat, Indian part, but was married off in Africa at the age of 13. She was a teenager. And her daughter I met at the University of Leicester, and I just got talking to her, and then she said that my mother is, uh, my mother is carrying um, you know, jewelry and other objects from her grandmother. So it was a generational pass on of uh, commodities, which become very revered. So she was like, I can bring my mother to the event and I'll bring that object. So I don't know how many of you know Surmedani, which is basically an eyeliner, but in the subcontinent it has historic value, like dating back to Mughals in prehistoric times, they, they were stored, they were made from camphor and coal and the suit was basically put in the eyes. And a lot of paintings depict that in British Museum and elsewhere. And uh, the containers were very uh, decorative, kind of uh, silverware or copper or different, you know, they were given different forms. So she had that ancient thing from her grandmother, which becomes like an heirloom. So how a mundane commodity becomes a part of a family heirloom. So that's what material memory is all about. So each speaker, whether a Bengali or uh, from a Pakistani, they all were made to carry objects which were very dear to the family because they had seen centuries of migration and displacement. So then the ob object became the mainstay of their conversations. And from there, they unfold the stories of partition, displacement, loss, love, family, harmony. So, you know, so that's very interesting how people get engaged through material history, to the family history, to the state narrative, and then to the nation. So it was going, you know, the other way around, rather than coming from the top to the bottom. So that's, and everybody was so happy to be part of that space, because I was scared that I'm getting so many different people in different perspectives in one room. And, and they said that we would love to have conversations like these, because we don't know each other's stories. So I feel dialogue and communication is one way to what you already mentioned for reconciliation within <coughs> the community. 
So this kind of builds on to my next question, but if you want to work in your answer to the last question as well, that might work quite well. But especially when we're kind of rebuilding, et cetera, how do you, especially people who, as you were kind of saying, when, when there's controversies or different opinions around these conflicts, how do we kind of work on our supporting, rebuilding, all of that kind of work when there's this controversy existing around it? And how have you dealt with or found addressing these difficulties in your work, which I think you touched on? I, I think you, you need to find a way of starting to deal with the pain and deal with the issues in a kind of non-political way. So to give you a very tangible example um, from the Cyprus conflict, you know, between, between 1960 and 1974, about 2,000 people were missing. Their fate was not known from the invasion and from the kind of intercommunal troubles in the 60s. Um, in the 90s, a committee for missing persons was established whose sole objective was identifying where the remains were of those 2,000 people. Today, there are still 967 people missing, so it's, you know, it's not by any way concluded. But um, tackling some of those very humanitarian issues in a way that does not bring legal culpability, so that the, the mandate of the Committee for Missing Persons is none of the evidence that's submitted can be submitted into a court of law. So it's not, it's not you know, nobody's, you know, touching on the question of apology, and that's not where this is going. It's just saying there are human stories, families who want to know where their loved ones are, what happened to them, want to bury them, right? And, and you have burials with just a fragment of a bone, but that's enough to trace the DNA and enough to give that family closure. So starting to get the communities working together on humanitarian issues that don't bring politics into it, I think is a very, very good first step. Can I add to that? I think that's really similar to what I would kind of, how you stole my answer. <laughs> um, so I, I'm not a historian. I work with a historian. Um, history is important in what I do. But at, at the moment in my research, I'm very much concerned about the here and now in the sense that um, when you have a group of three million people who have issues with accessing basic fundamental rights, um, so you don't have an identity card, so like you don't have a passport, you don't have, a, you can't get education, uh, you can't get a job, you can't be buried, you know, it's really basic, you can't, you know, it's just really basic rights. Now, we're talking four generations, so these are children who are impacted. Um, in, in my research, I've spoken as, talk to so many young people as well so you can get into school you can kind of go up to a certain extent but then you need your um, identity card to get your certificate so you kind of get stuck so very much we're concerned in our research of course the historical element but the here and now and what the issue is is that there's not an implementation of the law going on primarily because of discrimination, as I said. So the Constitution, the law says one thing. Article 25A in the Pakistan Constitution guarantees that every child should have the right to access education. But this is not being implemented. Now, um, so we're like we're advocate, we're working with the, we're advocating for this through our research. But how, how are we doing it? Uh, we're trying to do it in a way where we talk about the contribution of this uh, this uh, community to Pakistani life, to Pakistani culture. Um, you know, sure, you might not be able to work. Some, I mean, not everyone has. A, like some people do have access to identity cards, it's really complex. But, but the, a large portion of the community is involved in textile and fishing. Now that makes up a huge part of the Pakistani economy. So we kind of build on that in our research. We, we talk about the, the missed opportunity for all these young people. Um, um, so I made a, a, a film called Bishali Adrift. Um, we haven't released it yet, we've done private screenings. But through things like films, comics, <coughs> trying to capture the imagination. And in, in the film, for example, I've been want, working with a gymnastics team. Uh, they're stateless gymnasts. So they're amazing gymnasts who are in Macha Colony. Macha Colony is a huge informal settlement in Karachi. There's about 800,000 people there and a lot of the community members are there. So these kids, um, they, they've learned gymnastics through this association. They're competing within Pakistan, but they can't compete internationally because they don't have access to a passport. So it's kind of building on that, well, look what they could do. You get them this identity, they could represent their country. 
And as we said, like four generations down the line, these children, I mean, they have no idea about the history of what happened. Like even their parents, and maybe their parents' parents and their grandparents, yeah, they could probably talk about it. But they were born in Pakistan and their parents were born in Pakistan. They celebrate Independence Day on the 14th of August. They, you know, but they're being deprived of these basic rights. And, and so we're really trying to, we're trying to push for an implementation. You know, we might not say, okay, cancel, give everyone ID cards, but we're, we're pushing right now for implementation of, um, you know, birthright citizenship, which is just solely, which is in the constitution, and also implementation of 25A access to education. So we're trying to do it in a similar way, but really, I mean, uh, it's, it's, opportunities that are missed as a result of this. It's slightly different, I guess, what you guys are doing, but it's, it's, it's quite tragic, actually. Yeah. Um, I, I think one thing, you know, I talked earlier about the need for com community leadership, but I think a real solution needs leadership from both ends mm. uh, as well. Uh, leadership from the top is critical. Uh, I think if we're to really address this, and if you take the example of, of Ireland, if you look at, you know, uh, President Mary Robinson, Mary McAleese, and now the current president, Michael D. Higgins, they've shown huge leadership. Unfortunately, that isn't then reciprocated, if you look, you know, who do they look for, what's the equivalent? But the best defining moment was probably then the Queen's visit to Ireland, when the Queen and Michael D. Higgins, so you two leaders, and you're know, recognizing the, I suppose, neutral position that a president holds in, in Ireland's state and the position of uh, the, the Queen in there, that was probably a defining moment. And indeed, I would say that was probably when Ari Northern Ar or Irish and UK relationships were at their highest. You know, whereas today, I'd say we're probably at one of our lowest points. Uh, but that's driven by Brexit and other complicated things and so forth. But it's, so it's that leadership at both ends in some respects. I'd like to open it for a bit uh, um, questions from the floor before we have to finish. So does anyone have any questions at the back? Partition is usually, oh, thank you. You normally, you made the point that partition is usually presented as a solution um, to a problem such as in India. Um, why do you think that the much more actively malicious partitions such as in Nagorno-Karabakh in Armenia and Azerbaijan or in uh, Central Asia by the Soviet Union, for example, why do you think that they are spoken about much less than, for example, in Ireland or in India? Yes, well, I would think it, it's worthwhile thinking about partitions more broadly, uh, the Soviet Union obviously being an example, y Yugoslavia being a, another example, and people don't now want to unpartition Yugoslavia. So I would just look at the problems in the round. And in most of these situations, I mean, I view this politically rather than psychologically. That's just uh, psychologically or in terms of identity politics. That's just my, as it were, field of competence rather than anything else. What are the options? If you take the Irish case in, in 1920, there was either um, union, civil war, partition, secession. The union had failed, which is why there was secession which led to civil war and, um, uh, and partition also. So um, it, it, seems to, it seems to me um, that um, the best option going forward, I, I slightly differ on this um, in terms of victim narratives. Uh, now, of course, I accept that there are individual victims. There's no doubt about that. And I, of course, know them in the case of Northern Ireland in um, great detail. But communities of victimhood, to me, are counterproductive because there are no community victims in Northern Ireland, in my view. That's to say, there are two culpable sides. Um, no, uh, Protestantism constructed an exclusive regime. The IRA fought um, a needless war. So rather than perpetuating victim narratives by various communitarian means, they should both acknowledge that they've perpetrated um, as much as has been inflicted upon them, and get beyond the victim narratives. As regards uh, Nakorno Barbak and Nakorno, Nakorno Kabak in, in particular, um, why do they have less profile? Um, well, I just think, you know, um, it's to do with familiarity, but I mean, a lot of people who've worked on Northern Ireland have worked, I mean, academically on other um, partitions, so it's not as though that there's no attention, but I think it's the case that. 
with media cultures, um, certain, certain conflicts gain actually prestige and attention. I mean, we see this going on now. Uh, whereas there are many, 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 many wars being fought in the world at the moment. So it's a question about why there are prestige conflicts uh, and others that fall beneath the radar. Um, it's to do with, you know, domestic activism. So, And it's probably to do with the UK prism, right? I mean... Prism? Uh, the, yeah. the, the lens that you're looking at it through, sure. right? The, the, as you said, the, there are big diasporas from Ireland, South Asia, Cyprus in the UK, not so much Armenians. We do work with the Armenians, about 20,000 of them in the UK. So I think it's, it's to do with that media activism that because you're in the UK, as a function of British colonial rule in these various countries, actually what has happened is there's been a big migration from those countries to the UK. In the case of South Asia, in the case of Ireland, in the case of Cyprus, yes. because you could. Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh, not same option, optionality isn't available there, so you don't have the same size of diaspora, therefore you don't have the same either political attention or media attention around the issue on that specific. Yeah. Uh, British, like you said, that partitions were done with good intentions as a solution. Strongly disagree with that because in 1905, the British under Curzon, who was the Governor General then, partitioned Bengal. And it was such a disaster that he had to turn it back in 1911. He lost his job because of that. And the same thing they tried again in 1947. Didn't they learn from the 1905 experience? And very uncanny resemblance, the Radcliffe line, which divides India and Pakistan. The same line was chosen to divide Bengal when they knew that it didn't work. Second, second, uh, second, point, second evidence I'll give is, until December of 1947, they had not released what the boundary is going to be between India and West Pakistan. So people didn't know that Lahore was going to be in India or not. And very strangely, the British said, well, you can either, uh, either Calcutta will go to East Pakistan. If Calcutta goes to East Pakistan, then India can have Lahore. Is it like kind of you know, one of the pieces that you're trading? You have to decide very clearly what you want. And this led to, as you said, loss of 10 million lives. And uh, Jammu and Kashmir not yet decided. It's the most expensive war, a silly war that has been fought even today. You're fighting a war in Siachen Glacier because of that. You don't even know what the border is. It's moving. It's a glacier. Mm. And these are the consequences of British stupidity. That's just not in India, all around the world. So it's done because of incompetence. I would even argue that it was done with malicious intent. Yes. I've, I've heard these arguments many, many times. I, I'm not an advocate here. I'm not a partisan here. I'm an historian. I never said good intentions. I said intended as solutions. An intention to evolve a solution does not mean it's benign. Mm. It doesn't mean it's successful. I'm just trying to give a bit of context for reality. British, Brit it was never an intention to partition Ireland at all by Protestants, Catholics, or the British government. It was an unintended outcome and indeed a policy blunder, but that's part of the complicated world of, of um, politics. So uh, I'm not advocating a position, I'm just explaining, I've worked on British state papers, I know what British policy was. Okay, keep shaking your head, it's not really a productive conversation. Um, what, the Irish partition was not a political blunder? Yeah, but that's, okay. I just said Ireland, yeah, that's, thank that's you. what I said. Any other questions? Yes. Hello. Um, just to talk in regard to colonization and populism. Um, I was going through, um, for example, we'll start with India, the rise of the RSS and the rise of the BJP. With Bangladesh, you have Sheikh Kasina and the rise of populism there. Cyprus, there wasn't many examples, um, but Ireland as well, a rise in populism. Do you think that could be attributed to colonization and specifically in the case of India, Pakistan, neo colonization? Would you like to take it? I'm not sure if I want to answer this, but I, I can I can speak to I don't I don't have the expertise to talk about the Modi government. I'm, I don't think I should answer that in this regard. But I want to kind of speak a little bit to the Bengal question. 
And it kind of ties a little bit to, to what you're saying, and it is a bit about racialization, but I'm not answering directly your question. So, um, <laughs> Punjab and Bengal, two provinces that were divided, and I think what's really interested about, uh, interesting, because uh, I was kind of, if you over, have an overview of the area, if you look at some of the, the issues around, again, sorry, I study citizenship, I'm working on citizenship, but issues around citizenship at the moment, you know, is this idea of, again, the Bengali is the inter eternal outsider. So you have, the community I work, the Pakistani Bengalis, you've, ha you've had the Biharis who were the refugees who were kind of um, stranded in Pakistan. Eventually they did get their, sorry, stranded in Bangladesh. They did get their identity cards, but still discrimination prevails. You have the Rohingya movement around, you know, it's kind of when an area is divided and it's similar kind of, I guess it's kind of, I'm talking to, I mean, I am talking about cultural similarities and, um, you know, when I'm speaking about this. So you have the Rohingya issue. Um, you also have, um, within Bangladesh, a huge refugee population. And then recently, the Assam issue, which I guess slightly speaks to what you're talking about and the uh, Citizenship Am um, Amendment Act that happened. Um, and so I don't think there's a coincidence that all of these issues around citizenship and otherization um, are tied to this particular group, this, this area that was divided. Now that doesn't answer your question, but in terms of, the, and please, Aditi, maybe you can speak to this more, uh, but um, in terms of um, the, this um, national registration of, citi uh, of citizens, and I, I, again, I'm not an expert in this, there has been a lot of um, criticism of it because it's directly targeting Muslims, one group. Um, and so, you know, I, don't, I haven't answered your question at all, but I'm trying to kind of connect the two. That, you know, there is, you know, groups have been divided and othered across a similar mass, and there's a lot of issues that have arisen. Um, who would like to talk about populism? I will, I want to, I'm, would you like to do? I don't think as a Pakistani I should talk well, about Well, I don't think this. populism is called by, caused by colonialism or neocolonialism, no. I mean, do you? Yeah. I see. So why is the populism in many countries with no history of colonialism or neocolonialism then? For example, if you take... I mean, everything is certainly explained in world history in court through one lens. I think it's very narrow and partial. But if you take... Or obsessive, even. India, for example. Um, populism. Um, take the, America, for example. There's populism there. Take Hungary. There's populism there. But in the case of India, populism and colonization, it's very strongly linked because of the fact that prior to British rule... What about prior to British colonization, mm. the previous colonization that already happened in India then? Why is not that, that not the original? I mean, in, India is a scene of migration for a thousand years. But if you look it's, it's at not, the population... It's not just one population settling there. It's many, many, many. If you look at populism now, it's more to do with heightened race relations, and the British are to blame for it. Really? Okay. Do you believe that? Do you believe not? Jinnah has nothing to do with it. There was no movement for the secession of Pakistan from India after independence. That was all fabricated by Britain. I don't think so. There's just no historical basis for this. Perhaps we can move on to um, another question. The last one. Yeah, maybe one of the final questions. It's a bit of a technical one. Thank you. But I was just wondering, um, you spoke earlier about victims in Ireland, and I was wondering, how do you define and quantify victims and survivors in your surveys, especially given the sensitive nature of what has happened and the reluctance of people to talk about what happened to them? That is an incredibly, I think, astute question. The definition of a victim is contested. It took a government order in 2006 to define who a victim was. And many, many people disagree with that definition because that definition includes virtually everybody. Uh, like Prince Harry, he, he's a victim. I'll give, you, I'll give you a real example to that. So the Shankill bombing, which was uh, many, many years ago, horrific bomb, uh, a bomber, IRA bomb, was carried into a fish shop on the Shankill Road and eight people lost their lives. So nine people lost their lives. One of them was the bomber, Thomas Begley. Under the term of the definition, he is a victim. 
So he carried the bomb in. One of the victims was a lady called McBride, and I've got to know her husband very well, Alan. Alan can see it from both sides, and he is an example of somebody that can reconcile. Uh, and I would say he's a huge example we should all look to to sort of see how you come to terms with these things. But there'd be many who would say, Begley's not a victim. He was the terrorist and so forth. When you fast forward then, government introduced something called the Victims Payment Scheme a couple of years ago, which is effectively, for want of a better phrase, it's a pension scheme for somebody that was seriously injured during the troubles of the conflict. Uh, so if you were seriously injured during that, then you couldn't work, you couldn't build up your workplace pension. So it effectively tries to replace that. At the very last minute, government stepped in with an amend on that. Mm -hmm to introduce a clause that says, if you were injured by your own hand, you can't qualify. So long-winded way of saying, we haven't identified yet, really, or agreed who a victim is. And it depends who you talk to. Uh, you know, another real life example, I've got very friendly with a, a lady who was three years of age when her brother was shot dead. Her brother was shot dead 21 years of age. He was carrying a weapon. He was in the provisional IRA. The same boy was lifted by the, the army when he was 16 years of age and locked up for two years in internment, without, so prison without trial for two years. He joined the IRA when he was released from the Maze Long Cash. Three years later, he was shot dead. Now, is she a victim? She was three years of age whenever her brother was shot dead. Some will argue she's not a victim, but yet she grew up without her your sibling. So it's very, very, very difficult, and it is, it's very, very emotive. Uh, I can see it from all sides on it all. I meet many groups that talk about just innocent victims, uh, and that in itself can be very difficult as well. Uh, who's an innocent victim? You know, everybody suffers, but the best way I always look at it is the mother's tears are still the same. It doesn't matter what the son was about, the mother's tears are the same. The grief that the family go through is the same. And I think in a civilised world, we've, we've got to look at that. But that does need reconciliation. It needs that degree of acknowledgement. Uh, it needs a huge degree of maturity and how we move on. So it's a great question. Thank you for it. Yeah. I think we have time for one final question. In the um, I want to ask you about what you think the process should be for reconciliation in Ireland. Um, you're talking about Bloody Sunday. Tomorrow is the anniversary of Bloody Sunday. Um, if you're going to push back and say that, oh, we can't arrest these people or things like that, you should just have a, um, a thing for information. I think it, if you talk to any of the Bloody Sunday families, they're undoubtedly still affected by what happened 52 years ago. Yeah. Um, so what do you think, how you strike the balance between that? I also want to push back on the thing you said about you don't think there's communities of victims. I think you'd find it very hard if you walked into West Belfast and asked anyone if they had a father, a grandfather, an uncle who was not interned, you'd very struggle to find. That's one side you're mentioning. There's two that's sides. one side as well, but you could go somewhere else and yes, do it as well. Okay. I, I, again, apologies to the panel. We, we're, you know, we should maybe have the, the sort of the, the Northern Irish conversation on this. Uh, I mean, I, I have opposed the Legacy Act from day one. Uh, the Legacy Act introduces an amnesty, so in exchange for information, we will uh, effectively make sure you're not prosecuted. There's different ways to do it. Uh, you talked about yeah, recovering information about people that uh, had disappeared. There is in Northern Ireland, the disappeared, and it's modeled, I think, very much around some of the work that was done in Cyprus, which tried to recover bodies that people were, that had been, people had been abducted by the IRA, IRA buried and uh, no trace had ever been found. It has been successful, but it was done on the grounds that there was never a prosecution. Uh, but I think a blanket amnesty is the wrong approach for any community, and you know, uh, good, good contact with some of the Bloody Sunday families, they would agree and so forth. That's why I, I don't think any government introducing one solution, which they've tried to do with the legacy bill, is a solution. I think a sol we've had solutions in Northern Ireland, they just haven't got over the line. Stormont House, Hass O'Sullivan, all of these, they were good solutions negotiated by every political party. Involvement with, with the Republic of Ireland, in some cases involvement with America. All those players coming together, it needs that. And it needs the communities engaged. I think you're quite right. We have to look at the hurt that communities have been through. Uh, there's a whole debate about, you know, I, and I agree with some of the things you talk about. We, we unfortunately continue to 
to weaponize our victims. Mm. Christ, mm. that's the point I'm making. I'm not saying there aren't individual victims. Yeah. So that's never what I said. I, of course there are. Yeah. There's no doubt about that. And I've been to West Belfast many times before you were born. But um, it's, to, it's for either rival community seeing themselves as intrinsically victims is the problem. Myself, I think there's a problem with the Good Friday Agreement, which it was not a final settlement, and it was not designed as a final settlement, because final jurisdiction over Northern Ireland has not been agreed. It can be changed um, by a plebiscitary vote. As a result, the two sides continue to agitate over that. That's why the DUP don't want a final settlement in Stormont, and um, Sinn Féin is not committed to the existing borders of Northern Ireland. That, that's why it's ongoing. It was expected that that would dissolve in 1998 over time, that it just wouldn't matter anymore. It so happens it does matter because both main parties have campaigned on that basis ever since. So it's just a flaw and we hope that we get beyond it and, you know, that the question of the border doesn't become the only question in the politics of the island. That's, there's no other solution. Great. Um, thank you so much to all of the speakers for taking part in this conversation and thank you everyone for attending.